in the name of God who loves us and calls us to respond. Amen. How did the hosannas of Palm Sunday turn to the crucify him of Good Friday? Five days. Just five days. Or for those of us who are here on Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday, about 50 minutes. How did the hosannas of Palm Sunday turn to the crucify him of Good Friday? Well, Good Friday last year, a woman in Baltimore called up her daughter who lived in Arkansas, and she was quite distraught on the phone, barely finding her words. I'm I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but your father and I are getting a divorce. It's been 30 years, and we're both miserable. Now, I I don't want to hear the objections. I can't stand to talk about it anymore, so call your sister in California, and you let her know. So the daughter, catching her breath, called her sister and told her the news on the other end of the line. And her sister, flabbergasted, said, what? They'll do no such thing. Don't worry, I will handle this. So she hangs up on her sister and calls her mother and says, you are not getting a divorce. You will not do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my sister back and we're both flying there tomorrow and you will wait until we get there before you do a thing. So when the mother hung up the phone, she looked over at her husband, and with this sort of Grinch-like Ryle smile, she said, okay, both girls are coming home for Easter, and they're paying for their own tickets. (laughs) This year, we've taken a different approach to this Palm Sunday liturgy. Actually, so that this transition, Palm Sunday to Passion, isn't quite as much of a whiplash. We'll hear the Passion reading from Mark's Gospel as the very last part of our liturgy today. Sending us and setting the tone for Holy Week. And we'll invite you this morning to depart in silence. Whenever you are ready. No agape today. We have a guide to Holy Week here at St. Mark's for you inserted into your bulletin to help you prepare for these coming days. It is our hope that you will join us for any or all of these liturgies and services to come. But even if you can't, perhaps to read more about them to help you pray through this week. For those who are interested in Continuing the conversation of the Passion, Debbie and I have prepared a forum on the meaning of the cross and the Passion. And you can join us over in the Kennedy Room following a time of silence after the Passion for this conversation. We took a different approach, in part because in the spirit of one of my namesakes, I wanted to have a brief fireside chat with you this morning as your interim rector. Now, many of you were here last week as we commissioned the rector search committee for St. Mark's. We all raised our hands over Anne, Peter, Marjolyn online, Ken at the 8 o'clock service, Lena, Lodovic, Virginia, Jessica, and Marina. And when we did that, we responded to a series of questions. One of which, and I pointed this out at the time, was asked, will you set aside your assumptions or expectations for what your new rector should look or be like and open yourself to new possibilities for the gifts and for new possibilities and gifts that the candidates for rector may bring to your parish. 
And we all answered, hopefully without crossing our fingers behind our back, we will with God's help. Now, beloved, this, in my opinion, is a Palm Sunday question. And I wanted to take a moment to unpack it with us as we not only embark upon Holy Week, during which we are caught up in the final things of our faith, as it were, Jesus' death and resurrection, his promise to come again, but also as your search embarks upon their journey as a committee to bring to the vestry and ultimately to who God already knows will be your next rector here at St. Mark's. Now, why do I say this is a Palm Sunday question? Well, to various degrees, there was a tension in Jesus' ministry throughout the Galilee. Because as belief grew that he was the Messiah, so did the assumptions and the expectation for what would happen when he came into Jerusalem. In Mark, this desire was generated even more so by the holding back of this revelation in what sometimes is called the messianic secret. That is, when Jesus says to someone he's healed, or to a disciple, or apparently to Episcopalians, tell no one what you've seen or heard. Episcopalians are really good at keeping the messianic secret. I preached a few weeks ago, you may remember that the Jesus were expecting an insurrection, but ultimately got resurrection. And so I say it is a Palm Sunday question, because as it says, will you set aside your assumptions or expectations of what your new rector should look or be like is, well, not so easy. For disciples who follow a triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and for those of us excitedly embarking on a search for a new rector. One of the more helpful portions of interim training they require of us for becoming interims is a bias awareness teaching. And yes, your search committee and vestry will receive some version of this in due course. It is helpful because as the question contains within it, we do, all of us, live with assumptions and expectations of what the new rector should look or be like. I'm remembering the power of this bias in the 1996 movie, A Time to Kill, when Matthew McConaughey's character, a lawyer, is defending Samuel Jackson's character in a murder trial. In his closing argument in that courtroom in the Deep South, McConaughey's character asks the jury to close their eyes and imagine what he's getting ready to tell them. He shares a gut-wrenching, horrific story of a little girl whose liberty and life are brutally taken. He draws the jury, and of course in the cinematography, he draws in the audience with this terrified story, eyes all closed, imagining it as he's saying it essentially telling us what happened to Jackson's character's daughter in the film. And then at the very end, he says to them of this little girl, now imagine she's white. And as he says it, their eyes open in the courtroom, stating essentially that was the farthest thing from what they were imagining. It isn't wrong to have assumptions or expectations, 
but it is also important to recognize hidden biases within them. And, as the question suggests, work to set them aside. This ultimately isn't something most of the disciples can do, as they basically abandon Jesus in the course of a few days after following him for more than three years. Even Peter denies him three times. It is hard to set aside our assumptions and expectations of what should be. But all is not lost on this Palm Sunday, going into this Holy Week, because, beloved, while Jesus di disappointed the assumptions and the expectations of the disciples, and I might add, can disappoint us in our expectation and assumption, the disciples still kept some modicum of hope that God was doing something with this teacher, this master, this Lord of theirs, that there was some openness, a crack in the door for them to choose, to risk, to go on to Galilee where Jesus said he would meet them. Who knows if he would show? Who knows if that was still a part of the plan in the way they we're thinking Jesus was trying to fulfill it. There is probably something to the disciples' hope, though, that is instructive for us. Because while it is hard to put our assumptions and expectations aside, hope yet abides. So even as we, with God's help, seek to put these aside, and to open ourselves to the possibilities and gifts that the candidates for rector may bring to our parish. We also live this Palm Sunday, this triumphal moment that starts our search, asking God to reveal our biases, our, our expectations. And in doing so, beloved, laying them this week before the cross. Because in this search, we may not go where or get what or who we want, but instead, who and where God tells us our new rector will meet us. That is the task to being faithful in this search. And I believe that hope is a beautiful thing for us at St. Mark's this Palm Sunday. So I want to close with a parable that I first encountered on one of the streaming Apple TV Plus shows called Stillwater. It's from the Eastern traditions. What I want to invite you to do is to close your eyes and take a breath with me. I want you to imagine yourself at the bank of a creek or a riverside, perhaps, as you hear this parable. Master Chu was at the river with her young student, Ying. They were washing their bowls. Suddenly, Ying spotted something unusual floating past. Teacher, she said, do you see that floating in the water? A scorpion, it seems. Scorpions do not swim, master. It must have fallen in the river. Yes, it seems so. If we do not help it, it will surely drown. Yes, we must help. And just as readily as Ying reached out her hand, she pulled it back again. Oh, forgive me, teacher. Scorpions have pinching claws and a stinging tail. And you do not wish to be hurt. Not to worry, my child. 